From eschewing the most obvious sequel tropes, to ignoring the narrative path everyone expected the story to take. These movies all surpassed expectations by taking the bolder, braver road that didn't feel like a studio mandated it. The lesson here, it often pays to trust skilled filmmakers. Gareth here from WhatCulture.com and here are 10 movie sequels that avoided obvious mistakes. Number 10, CGI Paul Walker, every fast film after Furious 7. The fact that Furious 7 turned out as well as it did is nothing short of a miracle. Considering the unfortunate passing of Paul Walker mid-production, forcing his role in the film to be completed with digital doubles, and his brothers Cody and Caleb acting as stand-ins. The end result is impressively seamless for the most part, and more importantly gave Walker's character Brian O'Connor a fitting and affecting retirement. Ever since Furious 7 did such an outstanding job keeping Brian in the movie though, fans have suggested it's just a matter of time before CGI Brian reappears in a future movie. Yet the three mainline fast movies since, for all of their faults, have shown surprising restraint in keeping Brian completely off screen. There are some undeniably awkward moments where the films have had to clunkily write around Brian's absence, especially with his partner Mia still being in the mix, but it's certainly preferable to ghoulishly inserting Brian into the films. While it's certainly possible, even likely, that Vin Diesel and co won't be able to resist bringing CGI Brian back for the series' final dinner scene, it's at least a relief that the last three movies have respectfully avoided exploiting Walker's image in a way which many fans would surely find tacky. Do you think we'll ever see Dwayne Johnson sat on that very same dinner table down the road now his fast return has been made official? Let me know in the comments section down below. Number 9. Just Repeating the Same Movie, Aliens Ridley Scott's Alien is such a perfect cinematic organism that it would have surprised nobody if it led to a glut of more of the same sequels that basically just regurgitated the same space slasher formula ad nauseum. But in 1986, a little-known filmmaker called James Cameron rose to the challenge to deliver a sequel, Aliens, which basically sidestepped every last mistake an Alien sequel could possibly make. First and foremost, Cameron clearly had no interest in just doing the same thing again. Because while Ripley returns to LV-426 and comes back into contact with Xenomorphs, the context is very different. If Alien was a slow and suspenseful horror film, Cameron's film is far more action-centric, with Ripley being joined by the gung-ho, ill-fated colonial marines who lend the movie a considerably different energy to the original's Nostromo crew. Beyond that, Aliens also invests us far deeper in Ripley as a character per her surrogate mother interactions with young Newt, ensuring it's anything but a sequel that merely paints within the established lines. Yet Cameron's film also set such an impossibly high bar for the series, and sequels in general honestly, that nothing else in the Alien series has been able to touch it. Number 8. Making Rey Related to a Legacy Character – Star Wars The Last Jedi Star Wars The Last Jedi is a divisive sequel for many reasons, but writer-director Ryan Johnson made one incredibly shrewd call when penning the script, even if said call was ultimately undone by the next movie. After The Force Awakens riffed vaguely on the mysterious backstory of protagonist Rey, many fans rapidly speculated that she would be revealed to be related to a major legacy character, most likely being the daughter of Luke Skywalker. But Johnson evidently had little interest in tagging a contrived familial relation onto the sequel trilogy's lead character, and so had Kylo Ren reveal to her that her parents were in fact Junker nobodies, entirely unrelated to any established Star Wars character. Given Star Wars' tendency to draw convoluted links between its characters, and in turn make its apparently vast galaxy feel incredibly small and incestuous, it was a major breath of fresh air for Rey to be a hero entirely unreliant on nepotistic ties to the past. It's just a shame that amid the inane fan backlash over this revelation, J.J. Abrams decided to walk it back in sequel The Rise of Skywalker, where Rey was revealed to be the granddaughter of Emperor Palpatine. Yay! Number 7. Trying to top the original twist, Saw 2 The moment that Saw became a surprise box office smash, it was inevitable that Lionsgate would hastily greenlight a sequel. And though Saw 2 was ultimately released less than a year after the first, it impressively avoided one potentially fatal pitfall, trying to top the original's legendary twist. 
The first Saw movie ended with the jaw-dropping reveal that antagonist Jigsaw, aka John Kramer, had actually been posing as the corpse in the middle of the grotty bathroom all along. A twist so brilliantly unexpected it was basically impossible to outdo. And so for Saw 2, writers Lee Wanell and Darren Lynn Boozman smartly decided to not try and top the nobody can guess this insanity of that ending, opting instead for two more modest twists which were themselves incredibly satisfying. The first twist is that Detective Matthew's son Daniel was actually safe the entire time, due to his game taking place days prior, while the second revealed that Amanda was Jigsaw's secret apprentice. Both twists are well executed and genuinely surprising, yet the writers clearly knew there was no way to beat the original twist while still maintaining internal credibility, and so they didn't even bother trying. It's just as well because later films in the series eventually strain for more outlandish twists in an attempt to keep fans interested, yet these reveals mostly fell flat. Number 6. Ditching Ilsa After One Movie – Mission Impossible Fallout as entertaining as the Mission Impossible franchise is, until recently it's had a bit of a strange relationship with its central female characters, most often operating a revolving door policy, whereby each female lead is replaced in the next movie. The first four films in the series introduced audiences to characters played by Emmanuel Biart, Thandaway Newton, Michelle Monaghan, and Paula Patton, each of whom were gone by the next instalment, beyond two brief appearances by Monaghan in two subsequent movies. And so when Rebecca Ferguson was cast as MI6 agent Isla Faust in the fifth movie Rogue Nation, there wasn't much hope that she'd appear in the sequel Fallout. But thankfully, Fallout finally broke the unsavory streak, bringing Ilsa back not for a mere perfunctory cameo, but another beefy role of equal size to her prior appearance. Better yet, Ferguson will return in the upcoming two-part finale to the franchise Dead Reckoning, bringing her total appearances to four. That's half the entire series. Number 5. Having Rocky Win, Rocky Balboa Back when a sixth Rocky film was first announced, even many die-hard fans questioned the believability of a 60-year-old Rocky stepping back into the ring to battle a man roughly half his age. More to the point, many simply doubted Stallone's ability to put his ego aside and have Rocky lose against the heavyweight champ Mason the Line Dixon. After all, with Sly promising that Rocky Balboa would give the series a far more fitting ending compared to Rocky V's miserable climax, would it have surprised anyone if he overcorrected and gave Rocky an unrealistically happy ending where he triumphed over Dixon? But thankfully, Stallone's better creative instincts won out, and Rocky ends up losing the fight to Dixon via split decision. Yet in defeat, he goes the distance and proves himself regardless, circling back quite brilliantly to the original Rocky, which ended the very same way. Number 4. Solving the First Film's Mystery – Blade Runner 2049 When Blade Runner 2049 was first announced, the question on everybody's lips was will it reveal the truth about the original film's protagonist, Deckard? After all, the agonizing mystery over Deckard's true identity, whether he's a replicant or a human, has plagued fans for literally decades, and it seemed basically inevitable that the sequel would finally explain it one way or another. But instead, director Denise Villeneuve opted not to confirm Deckard status one way or another, refusing to even consider the question within the movie itself and instead allowing the enigma to endure. Given that Blade Runner director Ridley Scott and Harrison Ford have famously argued over whether Deckard is a replicant or not, Scott says yes, Ford says no, effectively ignoring the question and perhaps tacitly suggesting it doesn't even matter was absolutely the right way to go. Generally speaking, it's better to let a mythologized mystery live on forevermore rather than just demystify it, especially considering the backlash confirming it either way would probably cause. Number 3. Bringing back every original cast member – Top Gun Maverick Though Top Gun Maverick's marketing certainly suggested it'd be one hell of a visual feast, it was harder to get a bead on the story and how aggressively it'd function as a legacy sequel. Generally speaking, legacy sequels feel obliged to bring back as many prior characters as possible, as can often cause them to feel overcrowded or like they're desperately trying to activate the audience's nostalgia receptors. But Maverick actually split the difference quite brilliantly, because while it absolutely adhered to many legacy sequel tropes, it clearly didn't feel compelled to bring every character back just because. While we do get a bittersweet reunion between Maverick and Iceman, numerous key characters from the original movie are absent. Mav's original love interest Charlie, Top Gun instructors Viper and Jester, all of the original surviving pilots aside from Iceman, and Goose's wife Carol. 
rather than bloating the runtime out with perfunctory everyone is here cameos. Maverick achieves a considerably more streamlined synthesis of fan service and contemporary blockbuster thrills. As a result, it's one of the greatest legacy sequels of all time, baby. Number 2. Getting Peter and Gamora Back Together – Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 James Gunn may be one of the most canny filmmakers making superhero movies today, but fans were nevertheless worried that sentimentality might get the better of him in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. After all, Gamora's death in Avengers Infinity War created a major creative roadblock for Gunn, who hadn't expected that to happen, and so he was forced to pivot by effectively replacing the original Gamora with her 2014 variant who debuted in Avengers Endgame. As such, many fans suspected that Gunn would basically try to revert Gamora to her original state by film's end, having her fall in love with Peter Quill and more or less paper over the fact that the real Gamora actually died. But instead, Gunn sidestepped this very obvious storytelling gaffe, directly addressing the fact that this Gamora isn't THE Gamora Peter fell in love with, and ending the film without the new Gamora also falling for Peter. Ultimately, this version of Gamora looks favourably upon Peter by film's end, and gets a nice moment with him before he heads back to Earth. And so, rather than disastrously attempt to force a romance between them, Gunn deepened their character development by keeping things emotionally honest. Number 1. Going PG-13 – Logan Even though James Mangold's Logan, a quasi-sequel to both The Wolverine and X-Men Days of Future Past, was shot with an R rating in mind, fans were understandably sceptical that this rating would stick, considering how much of a ceiling it would place on the movie's box office prospects. But to their credit, Fox indeed allowed Mangold to deliver an R-rated finale to Hugh Jackman's linear tenure as Logan, excluding his upcoming role in Deadpool 3, which is set before the events of Logan. Rather than be yet another neutered PG-13 movie about a man with metal claws stabbing people to death, Logan puts his R rating to damn good use with ultra-violent action and liberal use of appropriately colourful language. The result was both the best Wolverine movie and Jackman's greatest performance in the role to date. While it also went on to become one of the X-Men series' most commercially successful films, basically everything worked out for the best, because Fox didn't cynically try to make a post-apocalyptic Wolverine movie appealing to children. Because that would have been a bit weird, wouldn't it? And that's our list. Know any other movie sequels that avoided obvious mistakes? Let us know all about them in the comments section right down below, and don't forget to like, share, and click on that subscribe button while you're down there. Also, if you're a fan of this sort of stuff, then please head on over to whatculture.com and find some more fantastic articles just like the one this video you're watching right now is based on. I've been Gareth from whatculture.com. Cheers for stopping on by and watching this video today. Now go and check out some more What Culture goodness on the channel, and have yourself the best of days. Bye-bye!